All right, so in terms, so you're gonna hear a whole lot of repetition with fruit diseases that you did in vegetable diseases and even with insects because sanitation and cultural practices seem to have a huge overlap. But in terms of uh, fruit production on the organic, on the no spray or even on the no spray level, we've got to focus on cultural practices first and foremost. So a lot of what you've already heard today as cultural practices get us prevention and if we can prevent disease we can prevent a lot of disease we have really eliminated that need to spray a lot of times um, and you're probably gonna see a lot have seen a lot of this before um, I think I first gave this to you as a fruit disease management cheat sheet it's your top one or two diseases in each of the fruit crop categories because really one or two diseases make up most of what you're gonna see most of what homeowners are gonna come complain about. Um, 80 to 90 percent of the diagnoses that come through the uh, our plant disease diagnostic lab are in these just one or two diseases. So if we can kind of nip that in the bud, we've really um, helped ourselves all together. So uh, first of all, cultural practices. Again, you've heard this so many times today, but asking the right questions, knowing what that disease is, starting from there. Um, proper recognition. Secondly, knowing the disease season. When are you going to see these diseases? A lot of times we can um, give our heads up to our homeowners in our newsletters, etc. And in terms of disease, I say this all the time, but um, symptoms are very different from time of infection. So knowing time of infection. For instance, fire blight is going to begin infecting during bloom. And, however, it's that, it's that crook stage, it's that shepherd's crook stage when you start hearing those complaints complaints. That's coming in May and June when infection is really occurring in April. So knowing that time of infection is very different from symptom development when we're talking about diseases. And then uh, finally, a lot of these diseases have to come through the diagnostic lab for proper diagnoses, but some are really easy and some we can diagnose through photographs. So just kind of knowing what those symptoms are and sometimes we can move those things through pretty quickly and help out our growers and our homeowners alike. So in terms of cultural practices, um, I am really big with um, disease resistant cultivars. I have not listed them today, but um, you see a lot of references to the Midwest tree fruit pest management guide and the Midwest um, small fruit pest management guide both of these are on our website so if you go to the uh, plant pathology page they are listed there all right if you go anywhere else if you google it Ohio State sells them um, but we have them we have the PDFs there some of the fungicide recommendations are outdated but a lot of the basic information is still really reliable so um, even in terms of no spray and organic uh, management, some of, these, some of these crops we will have to spray. We're going to have to spray apple, we're going to have to spray grape, and we're going to have to spray uh, peach most of the time. Okay, so that, th those are the hard ones. Those are the ones I call high input crops. But let's start with apple and pear. Um, I'm gonna talk primarily about apple, a uh, really common disease, cedar apple rust. Um, I call it apple rust here because there are three different rusts that affect apple here in Kentucky, cedar apple rust, cedar quince rust, and cedar hawthorn rust. We're most familiar with cedar apple rust. Usually if you say cedar apple rust, I'll just kind of in my head lump them all together. Um, they begin, do I have a pointer? They begin early in the season when our juniper or cedar are going to develop those, um, those cedar apple galls. Okay, those are those teleal horns that we see. Some people call them slimy octopi. Doesn't matter what you call them, but this is, this is the first stage in a, um, in a dual host system. So when those telia are released, that's usually March, April, right at the time that our apples start to leaf out. That infection is going to cause uh, those leaf spots in, in apple. At this stage, it's too late, okay? So um, really early in the season, young leaves are gonna start developing these small yellow spots. That's the beginning of the disease symptoms on apple themselves. And then later during the season, those isha are going to create these volcano-like um, structures on bottom sides of the leaves. They get larger and a severe infection will cause defoliation. These isha will release another spore type that again in mid-late summer are going to infect those juniper and the cycle starts all over again. All right, so 
You can see some of those galls in the fall in cedar, but primarily you're going to see them in the spring. All right, that's when that's when a lot of us notice them. But once symptoms develop on apple, it's too late. So protecting these apple early on from that infection in the first place is the only way to manage cedar apple rusted apple. So how do we manage it? Resistant cultivars. Absolutely critical. So on page two of ID 21, there, are, there is a list of resistant cultivars. There are going to be resistance to lots of different diseases. I recommend that you stress uh, resistance to cedar apple rust. Okay, so that's on page two. We did not put that in your binder, but I know you all know that. Um, that publication. Secondly, removing alternate host. Removing those cedar, removing juniper from the immediate area. Um, half mile, ideal, within the same landscape, within the same backyard, can really be effective. Okay, so while ideal doesn't always happen, we can definitely uh, take some time and, and clear out our own landscape. Stop planting those juniper in the landscape. Clear out our own fence lines. Um, so that's a, that's a recommendation also also to homeowners. Um, manually picking those cedar apples because sometimes they just won't remove them. Okay, prize juniper, whatever. Removing those cedar apples by hand depending on how tall the tree is. It seems like the biggest the biggest galls are always the highest up, right? So um, just but the hand pick any that you can. And then using preventative fungicides if those uh, homeowners choose to do so. All right, if there's an old, um, an old apple, so we hear that a lot, or I've heard that a lot since I've been here in Kentucky. I got this from my, grand, my grandfather, or I grafted it from somewhere. So if we're not going to plant a resistant cultivar, preventative sprays are going to be necessary. <clears throat> That's a choice that homeowners are gonna have to make. Oh, also, if you see also in your binder, we have some new uh, spray guides for you. Um, these cover organic no spray and low spray. So the apple one is here, and on the back side, the cultural practices are listed for each target disease. They're right in the back of the uh, PowerPoint. So you'll see them there, and you will see at that point, that's where fungicides are listed, those with the asterisk are organic. So those are there for you. So I'm not going to cover specifically, um, specifically fungicides. All right, and our number one disease on apple here in Kentucky and a lot of the um, a lot of the region is fire blight. Unfortunately, we all know that one quite well. Fire blight is uh, recognized primarily by that shepherd's crook um, symptom that occurs right about May June. June is usually when the panic stage starts, when leaves start to scorch and to blight. That's why we call it blight. It's sudden death, and the brown leaves, the black leaves, hang on. But fire blight happens much earlier. All right, the pathogen overwinters in cankers on the tree themselves. So any dead, dying, and diseased wood, that's where the pathogen overwinters. Bacterial cells build up in the springtime when it starts warming up, and the first infection stage is the blossom stage. All right, and that is, that is the first stage. That's where those cells continue to build up, and then young succulent growth is infected. Also, cankers. We have some cankers you'll see this afternoon. So if the disease continues to, to spread and to progress, you'll see cankers as um, infection continues through woody tissue. And it's through these cankers that overwintering occurs. <clears throat> so we manage fire blight um, through resistant cultivars again. That's the other one. So as you help your homeowners select resistant cultivars, think about cedar apple rust and fire blight. Not so much as the powdery mildew, not as critical, but these two really are. Resistant rootstocks. Some of our rootstocks are much more susceptible. Uh, some are more resistant. So HO82 has a list of uh, rootstocks. If any of you do grafting workshops, I encourage a lot of agents, when you teach these grafting workshops, try to get the disease-resistant um, scion and try to get some of these disease-resistant rootstocks. And start your growers out or your homeowners out with the right plants. All right, um, prune that dead, dying, and diseased wood. Get it out of there. Because if it's not there, your inoculum's not there. If you remove those bacterial, um, those bacterial inoculum in the first place, it's not there to infect and reinfect. Don't just drop it on the ground. Get it out of there. 
but Fuji and Gala keep us all busy because those are really those are the ones that really have the, the highest levels of fire blight that I see. There are some that are more susceptible, but these are the ones that are grown so much, especially at the homeowner level. That's what everybody has, or uh, Fuji and Gala, and they are susceptible to fire blight. Um, copper is um, an organically approved fungicide. Copper applied at dormant or what we call delayed dormant is going to help knock back those cells as they start multiplying on the surface of those cankers early in the spring. And as we can knock those back, we have reduced those, um, that initial inoculum, that, uh, those early infections. So those are my recommendations. Um, streptomycin, we really don't encourage homeowners to use it at bloom. <clears throat> Next are your summer rots. Summer rots should not be in a category all themselves. So a lot of the literature you see says summer rots. A lot of these infections do start earlier in the season, sometimes um, right after bloom. But summer rots develop uh, symptoms after bloom. A lot of sporulation, you'll see a lot of sporulation. I'm always begging for bitter rot. That's um, our research focus. But um, all of that sporulation, again, those spores move to healthy plant tissue, to healthy fruit. Infection occurs and we can lose entire crops. Honey crisp, extremely susceptible to bitter rot. Um, we can have an entire research program on honey crisp alone. So where does it overwinter though? We see it on those fruit. Where does it overwinter? Primarily on dead dying and diseased wood. There's some literature out there saying it will also overwinter under bud scales. We have not found that. And it loves to overwinter in rotten fruit or dried mummy fruit on the ground. So clean picking, and that this is gonna be the case with all of your fruit and vegetable crops. Clean picking, when you pick, pick everything. Two bins, one for healthy fruit and one for diseased fruit, and get it out of there. Don't leave it on the ground to overwinter. All right, and then when you do get it out, pick it up, literally pick it up, and bury, burn, um, Put it in the garbage can, get it off site. All right, uh, fungicides can be effective. Captan, really effective. It is, that is not organically approved, but in rainy years, we're gonna see a lot more of these uh, diseases than other years. This was a really good disease for bitter rot. Um, a lot of uh, confusion on the fruit rots. Um, insects, russeting from late frost, a lot of bird and uh, June beetle damage, sun scald, a lot of things are mistaken for your fruit rots and of course any kind of physical damage is going to result in secondary um, diseases, secondary pathogens. So a lot of confusion there. 